Hello, hello, hello. Still a nation, are we awake today? I said hello, hello, hello. Well, there we go, baby. I'm Arthur Motes, and I want to welcome you to Akashore Stadium. And today, we get a chance to talk to a Steelers legend who was both legendary on and off that football field. Now, this guy right here to the next to, or to the right of me came to the NFL in the 1969 NFL Draft when the Steelers selected him in the third round, 56th overall, out of Oklahoma State University. And once he joined the NFL, he went on to enjoy a 13-year career where he was an All-Pro. He also won not one, not two, not three, but four Super Bowl championships here. Now, okay, we are the Pittsburgh Steelers. We are the team that made winning Super Bowl trophies legitimate, made it a thing. So when we talk about being a Super Bowl champ here, we get really, really loud. So let's try this again. This guy won not one, not two, not three, but he was a four-time Super Bowl champion. Now that's more like it, baby. And he was inducted into the Steelers Hall of Honor. So without further ado, give a warm Pittsburgh welcome to number 55, John Cole. Thank you, thank you. Great to be here. John, first off, man, it is always great to be in the presence of another 5-5. Five, five. Right, one of my favorite pictures is uh, at training camp mm -hmm. we were taken. And I think, uh, uh, I was trying to think, there were 450, Jerry Me? Osonski. Yeah, Jerry O, Joey Porter was there as well. Porter. Absolutely. So we had, uh, and then we had uh, 55s that went all the way back from 1969 to like 2000 and whatever. 17, 18, yeah. whatever that was. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we know this is a rivalry game today. We got those rat birds in the building, and we know how rivalry games can get at times. But just take us through back when you were playing in the 70s, some of those rivalry games, man, and just how would you mentally prepare for some of those things out there? Yeah. Um, you know, the Ravens were the, I don't even, they, yeah. <laughs> they didn't even, they weren't even existent. But in that time, it was, it was Houston Oilers, and it was uh, uh, Oakland Raiders. And we'll celebrate the Oakland Raider Immaculate Reception. Anybody remember that one? Uh, we'll celebrate okay, that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but those were games that I don't know how, uh, when they say Immaculate Reception, that means God had something to do with it, right? Immaculate. But when you played Oakland, it always snowed. When you played Houston here, it always snowed. And it was always a physical ball game. You know, the guy, the defensive end from Houston, Elvin Bethea, think about it. I played him twice a year for 13 years and three times in the playoffs. That's 29 football games against one guy, 29 yeah. games. And I mean, you know, I don't know about your nose, Arthur, <laughs> but my nose got so flattened. And the same thing with Oakland. So fans loved it. It was a physical game. And I think that's what uh, you had guys like Donnie Shell, mm -hmm. Mel Blunt, Joe Green, Absolutely. got pictures of, you know, uh, my buddy Craig Wolfley will will do this. He'll do the game sometimes. I mean, he does the game every week, and he'll say they didn't get a push there. And I'm going, Craig, you don't push in football. Ask Donnie Shell. Ask <laughs> Joe Green. You don't push. You hit. And it was a hitting game. So no, without a doubt, and yeah. a game that y'all did at a high, high level. Now, as I said in the intro. You were a part of a team that went to win four Super Bowls. But if you could, just talk about what was the key to you guys being able to go on that type of run and sustain that type of dominance? Yeah, I think I just said the one thing, hitting. You know, we wanted 
we didn't want to hurt people, but we wanted to make it hurt. There's make a make them remember you, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and like I was talking about, the first game I played against Elvin Bethea, he beat me up. I was a rookie. I didn't know what I was doing. And so the next two or three games were pretty hard because he kind of knew that he established. And I had to, I had to come back and kind of take control. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then after that, you do. But the Steelers were, uh, I think, to answer your question, uh, we weren't going to fool anybody. I, I love the quote from Cliff Harris. You all remember Cliff Harris, Dallas? And they, he would say, well, we knew what they were going to run. And I don't know why he would brag that they knew what we were going to run because that, you ought to be able to stop us if you knew I what we were going to run. Absolutely. Yeah, but we were going to come off the ball. We weren't going to fool anybody. We weren't going to move people around, shift people. We're going to run at you and play football. No, without a doubt, without a doubt. We are joined right now by Steelers legend John Cole. So... I don't want to ask you to pick your favorite because if I had to ask you which Super Bowl was your favorite, it's like picking a child. It's very difficult to do. But which one did you enjoy winning the most of the four that you won? Yeah, well, we played uh, Minnesota, and uh, and and that was uh, you know that was the first time. But then we played Dallas twice. And Dallas had a defensive, you know, there's, as you know, mm -hmm. there's a game in the, within the game. There's Pittsburgh versus Dallas, but for me, it was John Cole versus Harvey Martin. Uh-oh. And if I'm, if I'm doing my job, then Terry Bradshaw is going to throw the ball and we're going to win the ball game. So anyway, uh, on the Tonight Show, they recorded Harvey Martin. Uh, a couple nights before the game, and then they played it the night before the game. And Harvey, uh, we won two Super Bowls, and then we, uh, then the, uh, Dallas won. Right. I think I can't remember who they won. I, they beat Miami, mm -hmm. and so he, Harvey, was the MVP of the Super Bowl the year before. And so they're on the, you know, they're doing this uh, interview stuff, and they're asking him. Well, will you repeat as MVP? Oh, yeah, I'm going to have four sacks. I'm going to do all this stuff. And my wife's going, did you hear what he said? He's going, hey, did you hear that? Did you hear that? And so he had really set up that, okay. And, uh, and, and I don't know with your teammates in Pittsburgh, but, you know, guys like Jack Lambert, Dwight White, you would think they'd go, Okay, you, we know we got confidence in you, you know. Well, it didn't work like that. They were like, you better buckle up, buddy. You know? So by the time the game came, I was so wired, you know. If I'd had a gun, I could have shot him, you know. I was, yeah. So that, that uh, third Super Bowl against Harvey Martin, that when he had been the returning MVP, was probably my favorite. Yeah. Oh, I love that story right there. That was beautiful. Now, as I said in the introduction, you were drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers in that 1969 NFL draft. But if you could, just take us through your NFL draft story. Did you know you were coming to Pittsburgh? Did you think you were going to go earlier? What was that dynamic like? Yeah, well, um, I played at Oklahoma State University. My sophomore year, our big rival is the University of Oklahoma. And my sophomore year, we beat OU, Oklahoma, and I'm I'm a sophomore. I'm playing against a senior nose tackle at Oklahoma, All-American, three-time All-American, and we beat him, and we scored all of our touchdowns right up over him. So the next day, that was Saturday, the next I got a letter Monday from the San Diego Chargers. I'm a sophomore. Man, San Diego Chargers already contacted me. And then I got a letter from uh, Baltimore. It was the Baltimore Colts. So for the next three years, I heard from every NFL team wow. except Pittsburgh. Oh. <laughs> and people would say the day of the draft, this is the truth. People would say, where do you think you're going to go? And I'd say, all I know, I won't go to Pittsburgh. The day of the draft, 
every NFL team, they would come. See, they didn't have the combine. So they would come and they'd wait for you to get out of class. And then they, you'd go run 40s and lift weights. And, and so I knew, so people would say, where are you going to go? I, I don't, all I know is I'm not going to, to the Steelers. So I thought the draft was like playing football in the backyard. I'll oh, take no. Arthur Moats. Okay, <laughs> you take Jerry Osowski. Okay, and it lasted an hour. So at lunchtime, I didn't know. They were still only in the third round. And I thought the draft was over and I didn't get drafted. So I went to the, I went to the uh, this is the truth. I went to the stadium to work out at Oklahoma State, and I walked in, and all my, oh, it's just like you guys are there. All my friends are there, and they're like, you got a phone call from somebody named Rooney. <laughs> somebody named Rooney. Uh oh. <laughs> somebody named Rooney. And so it was Art Rooney Sr., and he goes, y'all probably don't remember. But he goes, John, that's how he talked. And I went, yes, sir. He said, this is our Rooney of the Steelers. And I went, yeah, right. <laughs> and I thought my friends, I thought my friends had put some old man in, into calling me. I thought it was a joke. And I was so rude to Mr. Rooney. I was going, oh, yeah, right. He'd say, are you happy to be coming to Pittsburgh? No. <laughs> And so, so then that night, I was just so, Art, Arthur, I was so upset because I didn't get drafted. And so I thought, okay, I'll turn on TV to see where my friends are. And I'll never forget, <coughs> the sports comes on TV, Oklahoma City, and they go, they go, Eddie Hinton, first round, Baltimore Colts, John Cole, third round, Pittsburgh Steelers, and I went, that really... <laughs> it was for real. <laughs> that was for real. So the next day, I have to call our Rooney. I have to call him, and I'm apologizing. I was in tears, because, and he thought it was funny. He thought he thought it was funny. That, I didn't it. that is pretty funny, though. But we are definitely glad that that worked out like that, because you came here, and the rest was history, baby. But um, you did get a chance to play under the Hall of Fame coach, Chuck Noll. Just talk about what was that experience like for you, man, if there was anything that you learned from him that you uh, keep with you today. Yeah. You know, I, uh, Chuck Noll, I don't even know how to describe Chuck Noll. From a coaching standpoint, Chuck Noll was a technician. You know what I mean? Absolutely. He was a he, we were going to win a football game, not because we were going to fool you, but we were going to win the football game because we are going to out hit you. And that's what he would say. We're going to out hit the other team. And, and again, we had guys like uh, Donnie Shell, and he wanted hitting people, Mel Blunt. Uh, I, you know, I think two things, though, when I think of Chuck, no, Chuck, really had a hard time he was so into football and he wasn't the guy that was just gonna hey how you doing john you know, he wasn't that kind of just uh let's go let's go out have a beer he wasn't that way and so it was my second year and i think we're at training camp and i think chuck must have thought and realized we had never even talked my second year, he never even said a word to me. I played a whole year. He never spoke to me. And so, uh, and it was a training camp. And, uh, and I guess he got this idea in between practices that we would talk. So he sent the kid, when you're cut, they have a kid. He's called the Turk. Absolutely. And they sent the, the Reaper kid. Man. He knocks on your door. And he says, get your playbook. The coach wants to see you. Oh, no. Oh, no. So he sends his kid to come get me because he's going, he wants to talk. Well, when the kid knocked on the door, he said, uh, Chuck Noll would like to see you. 
And I thought, I'm cut. I'm cut. And so I grabbed my playbook and I started to walk out the room and I thought, he didn't tell me I was cut. So I took my playbook and I threw it as hard as I could in San Vincent, you know, those walls. Absolutely, cement, yeah. The, the, and that playbook bust open and a thousand pages <laughs> went all over the room. And I'm thinking, somebody's going to have fun picking this up. <laughs> So I walked down to Chuck's room and uh, I knocked on the door and he's got his back to me like this. And he turns around and he goes, oh, come on in. And now I'm really getting mad because if you're gonna cut me, don't be nice to me. Right, right. And this is the truth. He said, I was on vacation in Florida and I heard you like outdoor things. I heard you like wildlife. And I took these pictures of these woodpeckers. <laughs> woodpeckers. So I'm standing there, Chuck No showing me pictures of woodpeckers. So I'm looking at the woodpeckers. And then we get to the alligators. And he starts explaining to me, alligators' teeth go like this, and crocodile teeth go the other way. And I think I'm getting cut, but he's going to show me pictures of woodpeckers right, and right. crocodiles first. And so I'm going through the crocodiles. And so finally, we're done with pictures. And he goes, well, that's all. I just thought maybe you'd like to look at those pictures. And I said, I'm not cut. And he goes, no, you're having a great training camp. I just thought you'd like to look at these pictures. I'm not cut. <laughs> no, I just thought you'd like to look at these woodpecker pictures. So anyway, I walked back to the room. And I'm going, I'm not cut. I'm not cut. And I was really excited. And then I walk in the room, and there's all these 1,000 plays. <laughs> yeah. And we got a meeting before we go to practice. Oh. And I walk yeah. in the meeting, and everybody else has got their playbook. And they go, OK, turn to 35 trap. And I've got all these pages, and I'm dropping them, trying, <laughs> trying to get my notebook together. No, without a doubt. So sometimes things happen and you go, no, it can't have really happened like that. But it did. No, without a doubt. And we're glad that he did not cut you and that everything did work out. But I do want to talk to you about some of the work that you've been doing <clears throat> off the field. Um, you started a foundation, Adventures in Training with a Purpose, or more commonly known as ATP. If you could, just talk about the impact that it's having and the inspiration behind it as well. Yeah. Thank you, Arthur. Yeah. You know, we watch the news and, uh, and we know that we have military overseas. And we have people that have been stationed, for example, in Afghanistan. And, uh, and we really don't know what these people go through. Uh, and they come home and there are, you know, United States is a great place to have a heart attack. Yeah. Because they can do all this surgery and fix you right up. But you know what? There's something called <clears throat> post-traumatic stress. And then they put the word disorder after it. So if you get hurt on a kickoff or playing football, they don't say, oh, you got a disorder. They say you got a broken arm. But if you were in combat, and we have a man, mm -hmm. he took a bullet right here in the temporal lobe, and he's paralyzed on the left side. But he has a disorder. We have another guy, his name is Josh, and he had to go back to the Afghanistan the second time. And I said, Josh, I feel bad. You got to go back over there. And he said, yeah, the last time I was there, I had to kill people. And I don't, want to, I don't want to have to do that anymore. And so we know that not only are they away from their families, but they are being injured and they are having friends. We have a, how many remember Beirut, Lebanon? 400 Marines were blown up. We have a young man, he was in that, blow, in that explosion. And one of the guys with him are, he's saying, don't let me die. 
don't let me die, don't leave me. And the building came down, and they, they couldn't get his friend out. These are Americans, these are real American heroes. And, and, and what do they do? They give them pills. You go to the VA, they give you pills. And so, uh, how many of you have you gone out for a workout and you come back, you feel better? Yeah. Well, there is a lot of research that shows if you go do things, you work out, then it is healing. And uh, I can get, if somebody wants to know more about it, I can give you some of the books about it. So we take veterans every day, they come in and they train, and then we take them on adventures. And we just, we climbed Kilimanjaro. We've climbed, uh, there's a mountain next to Mount Everest, it's called Island Peak. We took, we climbed Island Peak. We go to the Grand Canyon, we go down and back up. So they'll train, and then we'll take them on a trip. And then we go on close ones. We may do a bicycle ride, from the point down to Ohio Powell or something like that. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's our effort to get help veterans get their life back. So thank, thank you for asking. No, without a doubt. And we appreciate the work that you are doing there. So now it is time for my final question. We always talk about that moment where we feel like we've officially arrived on the football field, that welcome to the NFL moment. So if you could, talk about your welcome to the NFL moment. That moment where it finally hit you that you were at the NFL level, man. Yeah, you know what? I don't know, you know, I love to see black and gold. I remember being in grade school. In the ninth grade, Arthur, I didn't even get a football uniform. We had 67 kids in my class in Owasa, Oklahoma, they had a jersey that had 95 on the front and 59 on the back. They wouldn't even give me that jersey. I didn't even give it the football. I was 5'4". I weighed 120 pounds. That's the truth. And I didn't even give it the football. My dad is 5'7". And, uh, and I read a book. This is the truth. I read a book. Bill Glass played for the Cleveland Browns. Anybody remember? And then he became a minister. And in the book, he talks about that if he would become an All-American, if God would get him, make him an All-American, right, right. he'd become a pastor. Well, I don't even get a football uniform in, in the ninth grade. So I'm going, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll be a pastor if I could just, if I could. Right, right. And then I started to grow. And I grew 30 pounds, seriously, I grew 30 pounds a year for four years, went to Oklahoma State. I just told you about being drafted by the Steelers. That year they drafted Joe Green, uh -oh. L.C. Greenwood, uh -oh. and myself. The next Let's year go. they drafted Mel Blunt, Terry Bradshaw, mm -hmm. and in 74, all that tremendous draft with Lambert and Mike Webster. And I got to be... Who, who can imagine? I mean, it's, 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 and, and a team like Pittsburgh, where you have, look around, you know, and uh, this year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Immaculate Reception. Let's go. And you all got to come to that, because I got, you know what, that play never worked in practice. <laughs> Not one time. And so, I've got to endure for the next two, two months. I've got to endure. I let my guy inside just a little bit so Terry couldn't throw the ball when he wanted to. He goes to throw the ball. My guy flashes in front of him, and he had to wait. That gave Franco time enough to get down the field so he could catch the ball because he never got down in the field in time right. in practice. So I had to... So now then, they're going to show this play over and over of me messing up to set up the Immaculate Reception. <laughs> Man, this has been awesome right here. I love it. Love it. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, can we please get even louder to thank John Cope for his time?
And now we will turn it over and get ready to take some pictures. But definitely need you to get loud because we got a big game today and we got to win it. So as always, here we go, Steelers. Here we go, Steelers. <laughs> 